chapter 2 of the book of Genesis uh, in this sermon series on creation. In my previous sermon, I spoke on man, the crowning glory of God's creation or the crown of God's creation. Today, we'll be covering the rest of Genesis chapter 2 and that will be verses 15 all the way to the end, verse 25. I'll be talking about the creation of woman. This passage is about the creation of woman and the relationship between the first couple, Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman. And the story of Adam and Eve's relationship serves as a blueprint of how man and woman ought to relate to one another in the context of marriage and family. Now, in the previous sermon, we learned that God formed man from dust. And after that, He put man in the Garden of Eden, a beautiful, beautiful place. And then He commissioned man to work in the Garden Paradise. It is a garden, it is a paradise. Everything is perfect as God's creation is perfect. I always say that. And yet, God told the man, you have to work on the garden. you got to keep it. you got to keep the garden. you got to work the garden. So today, we shall take it from there and continue with our text for today. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 25. Let's read it. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of the tree, of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good, not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. In some other translation, it is, it is uh, translated as, I will make him a suitable helper. They all mean the same thing. Now, out of the ground, the Lord, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to the beasts of the field. But Adam, uh, but for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Sometimes you wonder why God, God showed him all the animals and said, choose, you know. You know, we all believe that he created Adam intelligent. Why did God do that? We'll answer that later. Then the man say, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And a man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. Now this is a simple story but it contains a wealth of information about the value of woman and about the relationship with uh, her relationship with men in the context of marriage and family, which is indisputably the most important relationship in humankind. No other relationship comes close. You may have good friends. You have important workplace relationship with your bosses, with your subordinates, with your peers, with your clients, and with your, with your network of associates, you are a filial son. You are a filial daughter. And you love your children dearly. But none of these relationships is comparable to the most intimate relationship that God has created between a man and a woman in the context of marriage and family. And this is a very special relationship in terms, of it, in terms of its importance, purpose, and closeness. Here in Genesis chapter 2, God also lays the foundations concerning genders. Two biological sex, sexes, two genders. 
and the basic structure of marriage between one man and one woman. Now, it is God's plan that marriage is monogamous, meaning to say that marriage is between one man and one woman, not one man and two or three or more women. Neither is it the opposite. The Lord is clear about this. Polygamy or polyamory are ruled out. It is also God's plan that marriage is between a man and a woman, not a man and a man and not a woman and a woman. God created Adam and Eve. He didn't create Adam and Steve. This is the plan of God. These are God's creation orders. Now, through all the different messages, I've been highlighting a couple of things, and I say that these are creation orders, meaning to say that they cannot be defied. Men defy God's creation order to their own detriment. It will not just be sinful, they'll be held accountable, and they'll be judged accordingly. Now, today's text deals simply with two things. It seems simple, but there are a lot of embedded truth inside that. Okay, it deals with two things. What are these two things? Number one, a helper feed for the man. Okay, a helper feed for the man. Number two, the creation of the woman and the institution of marriage. First, a helper feed for the man. A helper feed for Adam and Adam represents the rest of us mankind. Remember that when God in the scripture used the man, he's referring to the fact that he created one man first. Not that he created a lot of men and a lot of women all at the same time. The man, the man Adam. I know that some of you read and you, you, you understand that Adam means man in general, man, mankind. But Adam is, uh, the meaning of Adam is also uh, uh, the name of that first man that was being created. So that's why I use the word the man, a helper fit for the man. You see, from the third day of creation onwards, when God surveyed all his work at the end of each day, he was pleased. And, and, and the, the Bible will say that, and God saw that it was good. We keep hearing that refrain over and over again from the third day onwards. And then on the sixth day, at the end of the day, God again surveyed all his work. Not just the work done on that day itself, but the previous other five days. And his comments was a little bit different. Okay, a di di little bit different. What did God say? Genesis 1.31 and God saw that everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. On a daily basis, when he saw his creation, it was good. But all taken together, God saw that it was very good. In other words, God was very satisfied with what he had created over the span of six days. And in my, in my belief, six 24-hour days. As I've said repeatedly in my previous sermons in this series, God's work is perfect. His work is always perfect. Can I put it this way? God is incapable of producing imperfect work. His work is always perfect and therefore, God was very satisfied, very happy and so he can say that, he can, uh, so we say that God's work is always good. God's word is always good and very good. But, 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 fascinatingly, after setting Adam to work in the garden, God took another look at Adam. And then, He made a remarkable command. It is not good that a man should be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. So far in Genesis chapter 1 and, and part of Genesis chapter 2, everything is good, 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 and very good. And then this is the first time God said it's not good. It's not good that man should be alone. Why did God say what He said? Why did He say what He said? 
is the creation of the woman an afterthought? Did God make an error of creating just the man and not the woman at the same time? What do you think? Of course not. My answer is no. I do not think so because God doesn't make mistakes. He's incapable of making mistakes. And we are talking about such a big thing here as the creation of the woman, okay? It'll be a big error if God makes a mistake. The creation of the woman later, after he had created Adam, was not an afterthought. God did it intentionally. God did it intentionally. The story is told in such a way as to bring our attention to the importance and to the value of woman. You must understand that in ancient times, even until only a few decades ago, women were not held in the same esteem as men. In the days past, women did not enjoy equal rights and freedom and access to all the blessings that God had created for mankind to enjoy. Women were kept aside. Women were kept low. Women were kept like a, a second-class uh, citizens, even today in some countries and among some ethnic groups, women are still considered second-class and they are treated not well. Okay, Some may be treated badly, some are treated not well. But by saying that it is not good for the man, Adam, to be alone, God is essentially saying that man is incomplete without the woman. God is not saying that, hey, my work of creating the man, my work, my masterpiece is not perfect. God is not saying that. A lot of people think that God is contradicting himself, but God is not saying that. A masterpiece is a masterpiece. God's work, Adam, is perfect. But God is essentially saying here is that Adam is incomplete without the woman. Adam is incomplete without the woman. Adam is a masterpiece, might be a masterpiece of God's creation. The crowning glory of God's work. Yet, God was saying here, Hey, Mr. Adam, you, 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 uh, uh, you, you are missing something. There is something missing in your life. You are incomplete, Adam. You are incomplete and un. Until I find a suitable helper for you, until I find a helper that is fitting for you, you will remain incomplete. That was what God was essentially saying. The helper, of course, refers to the woman. Okay, The helper refers to the woman. This is a big and loud statement about the dignity and the value of woman especially in the ancient world. Remember, okay? Moses wrote it 3,500 years ago. Ancient world, ancient culture, ancient tradition. Okay, so it's important. It's a big statement. It's a loud statement. Today, when we say that uh, in the context of Singapore, in advanced economy, it's like nothing really very much. But at that time, whoa, whoa. The Israelites reading it, understand it, understood it, and the surrounding culture, if they know about this, is what the Israelites believe because this is, what, this, this, this is what God told them. They will be like, whoa, whoa. You look at women in a way that's totally different from us. So remember the Genesis is the first book in the Pentateuch. Remember the Pentateuch, the first five books in the Bible. The Torah, which the Israelites considered the most important. They have the Old Testament scripture, but the first five books, they considered the most important, foundational. So, Genesis sets a counter-cultural tone concerning how God looks at women. A counter-cultural tone concerning how God looks at women and how the people of God, the Israelites, and today we should also be looking at women. In trying, uh, in all the ancient cultures, 
Women are second class and of little value. In Genesis, God say otherwise. God is saying women are important and women are of value. Value not in what they can do for men. Value not what they can do for society, but val intrinsically valuable. God created them valuable. Now in trying to push the point regarding the value of woman further, God got Adam to engage in the most comical exercise. Now I don't know about you. I look at the part about him naming the animals. I find it very comical. I mean, the Bible can crack some jokes and all that. Okay? So, uh, what, what happened was God paraded the animals and birds before Adam and asked him to choose which one would be the most suitable helper. So like I say, the whole episode looks like a divine comedy. Uh, in a sense, it is. But it is also, seriously, it is also an intellectual exercise. It involved Adam naming the animals and, bird, and the birds. Whatever, okay, we read whatever Adam called every living creature that was it, its name or that would be its name. Serious Bible commentators pointed out that Adam was not just arbitrarily naming the animals. It involved discerning and understanding the nature and the characteristics of the animals and the birds. It involved that. And remember that in the Bible, names have meaning. So names of animals have meaning. I, I, I don't know whether those names get carried down and today we got different languages. It's all confused. But names have meaning. The names that Adam attached to ev every animal describe its characteristic, describe its nature. So why is it important to know that? Here's, here's the reason. In doing so, God was making Adam to carefully consider the nature and the characteristic of every creature, each creature, and then intelligently pick the, mo the one that will be a most suitable helper. God make him go through the exercise. The naming exercise is, is, is really getting Adam to carefully consider, to carefully consider the characteristic of each animal and then say which one would be the most suitable helper for him. Now, this is how we should also be choosing our life partners. Don't just fall in love. Okay, you can fall in love, you can also fall out of love. Young people, you get infatuated, there are things to consider, right? Many things to consider. One of the things is that you cannot be unequally yoked, right? You must have a Christian girlfriend, you must have a Christian boyfriend, okay? Uh, before I detour further, the idea is that you must choose your future husband and wife, your future husband and wife carefully, with your eyes wide open. Now according to the text, God brought to Adam all the animals and birds that he had created all. The word there is every, okay? So God brought every bird every animal that he had created. So in a sense, Adam interviewed every single one of them. Adam interviewed every single one of them and carefully scrutinized them. But guess what? He found that none was suitable. None was a suitable helper for him. So later in the passage, as we will read, God proceeded, as we have read rather, God proceeded to create a woman and Adam found her to be a suitable helper. Adam found the woman to be a helper that is fit for him. What is the moral of the story? What is the moral of the story? The woman is the only suitable and fitting helper for the man, for Adam. So only the woman could complete Adam. None of the animals, some strong like the elephant, some sneaky like the snake, some mischievous like the monkeys, 
none of the animals could complete Adam as good as they are in their individuality. Can you put individuality for, for animals? Well, you know what I mean. But none of them could complete Adam. Only the woman could complete Adam. And I could almost imagine God saying to Adam, okay, so Adam, value her, cherish her, and love her for the rest of your life. Actually, for the rest of their life at that time is eternity. They haven't seen yet, okay? For all eternity. So in the same way, I'm speaking to all the men in Rock of Ages Church. Men, men, hear, hear. Hear from your pastor. Uh, your wife complete you, okay? Sometimes they irritate you. But you also irritate them, right? So it's both ways. But your wife complete you. That is biblical. That is theologically correct. Okay? Your wife complete you. So love her, cherish her, and value her. And all the women say, Okay. Some women are sleeping. And all the women say, Okay, so this, today's message, I didn't know it would go that way when I was preparing my message. And then as I was just going through and, and reflecting on some of the things there, I, and, and, and you know, some of these things pop up and all that, and it was really an interesting uh, discovery journey for me. So women, if you're pleased with me, uh, at, the, at the end of the service, later on you can buy me a good lunch. <laughs> or I can pull all your money together, today I'll have a lavish lunch. So after all the tedious exercise of screening through every species of animal and birds, which ended in futility, God proceeded to create the woman. Now, however, however, before I talk about the creation of the woman, I want to ask the question, what does it mean? What does it mean for the woman to be a suitable helper for Adam? What does it mean for the woman to be a suitable helper for the man? What does it mean? You'll be surprised that part of the answer lies in the naming exercise of the animals. Well, I'm not comparing women to animals, okay? But part of the answer, okay, uh, comes from the naming exercise. Genesis 2, 19. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. You know the word call in the original Hebrew language is the word kara. Okay? It can also mean name. To call, to name. So that is the, the, the idea. Not just call, but to name. To call, to name. But kara, like in many words in Hebrew, kara had another example. You know why Hebrew had multiple examples? Because you know in our English vocabulary, we have 700 over 1,000 vo words vocabulary. But the Hebrew language has less than 20,000 vocabulary. So one word means multiple things. Okay? So kara here has also another meaning, a nuanced meaning. You see, to confer a name upon a thing or to confer a name upon a person uh, means that you have authority over that thing or that person. It is always the person with authority calling and naming the person under his authority. Am I right to say that? I mean, you can't call your boss and say, do this, but your boss can do that to you. Person with authority is the one that call. Okay, person with authority, name the person under the authority. So when Adam gave all the living creatures their name, it shows that Adam had authority over the animals. And in a sense, this fulfilled the dominion mandate. Not the full fulfillment, but Adam, the first man fulfilled the dominion mandate. Remember Genesis 1.28, we go back there again, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over, and have dominion over, that's a dominion mandate, dominion over what? Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. 
In our context, dominion means master the earth's resources, master your intelligence in order to innovate, to create, to do all. So that's part and parcel of what dominion uh, over the earth means. Okay? But think about it. Think about it. How? How do we how do we accomplish this dominion mandate? Okay? I mean, uh, if, if, if we can't even, uh, without the woman, it is impossible. We can't even fulfill the first mandate. Be fruitful and multiply. Man, go and do it alone. Uh. How? Not possible. You can't give birth alone. Okay? Let me give you a few more examples. When Eve gave birth to her third son, she named him Seth. Genesis 4.25 And Adam knew his wife again and she bore a son and called him Seth. And then another example here. When God called Isaiah to serve him, Isaiah 49.1 Listen to me, O coastland, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named my name. God named Isaiah. Okay, and God called Isaiah. It is always the one with authority calling and naming the one that is under authority. Never the other way around. I'm saying all this to lead us to a point, okay? So here is where things get interesting. Very interesting. Adam didn't just name the birds and the bees. He also named the woman. He also named his wife Eve. It wasn't God that named, called the woman, woman. It wasn't God that gave the name Eve to Eve. It was Adam that called the first woman, woman. It was Adam that named Eve, Eve. Genesis 2.23, Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman. Genesis 3.20, the man called his wife's name Eve. Can you see that? It's the man that called, it's the man that named. What does it imply? What does it imply? It implies that man had authority over his helper. It implies that man had authority over his helper. And that man takes the leadership, takes the leadership position in the context of marriage. Okay, it's always the context of marriage. Okay, not the workplace. It's a context of marriage. In other words, the woman is under the authority, leadership, and cover of the husband. You see the beauty of how God embed some of this wonderful truth in even the exercise of, of, of naming the animals. And we shouldn't be surprised that the scriptures teaches this right at the onset in the book of Genesis. This is not an Old Testament belief. This is not a New Testament, not, not just an Old Testament belief. This is also a New Testament belief and this is the Orthodox Christian belief. In the modern world that we live in right now where feminism is running unhinged and rampant. In the church, this belief of male headship in the context of marriage and family remains undisputed. Remain undisputed. In as much as many modern women are getting uncomfortable with it. You know why? Because it is stated everywhere. Okay, It is nuanced everywhere in the scripture. It is stated clearly everywhere in the scripture. It is a creation order that we do well to respect and to honour. If that is not convincing enough, then the term helper should be clear should be a clear statement of the role of the woman in relation to her husband. The description of the woman as the helper of the man defines her role in the context of marriage and family. The husband leads and the, wives, and the wife helps and support. So now maybe some of the women say, I don't want to buy you lunch anymore, Pastor. You're saying things not really what I want to hear. 
and you are a little bit upset with me, but okay, what I'm going to say is not just being politically correct, it's scripturally correct, biblically correct. Let's be clear about the wife's role as a helper. I want to say two things. Many things can be said. I want to say two things. First, the helper's role, the helper's role is not secondary. When we read the helper, we all say, oh, helper means secondary. The helper's role is not secondary, though it is in submission to the husband. The helper's role is not less important. It is as important as the leadership role of the husband. The helper's role is as important as the leadership role of the husband. Both the husband and wives must take their role their roles seriously and fulfill their responsibility conscientiously for their marriage and family to function well. Why? Because it always takes two hands to clap. If one hand refuse, refuses to cooperate, the marriage relationship will not do well. Okay? I've often say that you can manage a company, 20 people, 200 people, 2,000 people, not a problem. But you go back home, if your husband or your wife refuses to cooperate okay, on an objective issue, a biblical issue, you are dead in a sense that you can't go forward anymore. Okay? So, therefore, it is important for two hands to clap for both the husband and wife to cooperate. Otherwise, the relationship will suffer. Otherwise, the relationship may even break down. Now, by the way, talking about submission, it takes strength to submit. Do you know it takes strength to submit? A lot of people reckon submission as weakness, but it takes strength to submit. A submissive wife is a woman of great character. Okay? If you are a submissive wife, you have a great character. She submits despite knowing that her husband is imperfect. And the husband can make mistakes. And sometimes the husband does things that are nonsensical. But she submits anyway because the word of God says so. And in submission, she demonstrates trust, not just with her husband, in her, in her husband, but also in God, who ordains it to be like that. She's putting her trust in God. She's also putting her trust in the word of God. Also, when the Bible talks about submission, it does not mean that the husband has the right to dominate and bully the wife. He must lead lovingly. So can you see, the way God arranged the husband and wife relationship within a marriage is a delicate balance. You lead, but it doesn't mean that you can do this, this and that. Okay? You submit, you help, but it doesn't mean that you, you, you are, in, it doesn't mean that you are, your role is secondary. Second, the helper's role is not inferior. Instead, it is indispensable. The helper's role is not inferior. Instead, it is indispensable. There is nothing derogatory about being a helper. You may associate the role of a helper with being lesser or second class. But that's not how God sees it. And that's not what God means. It's not like that. Don't you know that sometimes God acts as, an helper, as a helper? Don't you realize that our sovereign, our majestic, our transcendent God, sometimes or oftentimes, He acts as a helper. When you cry out to the Lord for help and He comes alongside and help you, what do you think He's doing? He's acting and functioning in the role of a divine helper. I'll give you two sums. Psalms 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Psalms 121, verses 1 and 2. I lift up my eyes to the hill. From where does my help come from? Where does our help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. He's the one that made the heaven and the earth. He's a great creator God. But He condescend Himself. Come to your level and help you. The Lord is your helper. The Lord is our helper. God is our divine helper. So question, 
In his role as a helper, is God lesser? In his role as a helper, is God inferior? No, he's not. He remains stronger than we are, much stronger than we are. He remains supreme, he remains superior. So, being a helper is not being inferior, okay? The helper's role is indispensable. Imagine if God didn't help us. We will not be what we are today. The devil would have made a means mean of us a long time ago. He has declared war on Christians. God has been our helper. God has been our faithful, faithful helper. We cry out to God. We call the name of God. He comes alongside and He helps. You think God is our servant? No, God is not our servant. But He loves us. So He willingly, He willingly in a sense submit to your prayer because you need help. He said, I will come and I will help you although oftentimes you are doing nonsense. You sin. That's why you get yourself into trouble. But God is gracious. You repent, I will come alongside to help. God is our divine helper. The woman's role, and therefore the woman's role as a helper is indispensable. So I, 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 I jump ahead of time. I said it earlier. You take the dominion mandate, for example. Okay? Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over, you know, over this, over that. Uh, man, we can't do this by ourselves. We can't give birth by ourselves. You can't give birth, you can't fill the earth. You can't fill the earth, you cannot subdue it. You cannot subdue it, how do we have dominion over the earth? You can't. Okay, this is a very simple, a very basic example. Okay, that we, we cannot do without the woman. Okay, women are indispensable. The helper's role is not inferior. Instead, it is indispensable. Let me conclude this first point by saying that the roles of the husbands and the wives are complementary, okay? Meaning to say, uh, uh, they are complementary because men are stronger in some areas, while in other areas, women are better at those tasks. Am I right to say that? If you haven't observed that, then something is wrong. But, you know, in the feminist movement, they are fighting over equal rights and so on. I mean, Men and women are created equal, but we are not created the same. And we must be measured by different standards. If a woman can do this well, like in, in athletics that compete among women, you are the best among the women. You put them in a field of men. How to compete? That's a problem in the US right now with transgenderism. You can't compete, it will be unfair. Okay, you are not the same. God created men and women with different physical strength and stamina and energy. We are equal, but we are not the same. We are complementary. Men and women must come together. Husband and wife come together to work in the context of family and marriage. Men and women must come together complementarily to work for the good of our society, to work for the good of our church, to serve God together, men and women together. Together, the husband and the wife enhance their collective strength and mitigate their, their combined weaknesses. So ladies, your role as a helper is important and of value. Okay, and it is indispensable for the well-being of your marriage and your family. So the first point, a helper feed for the men. The second point is the creation of the woman and the institution of marriage. I don't know how to make it into three points, okay? It's like you can say the creation of the woman and then the institute, institution of marriage, but the two seems to be, you know, weaved together, lumped together. So I'll put both as a second point and I'll talk about both in the seamless manner. So, you know, after... Adam went through that tedious exercise of, of naming the animals and trying to select for himself a helper, fit for him. After that, God proceeded, okay? God have taught Adam a lesson. Now you know that you cannot find a suitable helper amongst all my creation. 
Okay, now you understand. Uh, you're going to understand. Uh, when later I created a woman for you, you're going to love her, cherish her. So after this, God proceeded to create the woman. And the act of creating the woman is fascinating. Very, very fascinating. God didn't create the woman from dust. God created the woman from man. What did he do? He put Adam to sleep and then from the side or from the rib, uh, it may not be a rib, it may just be the side of a Adam. He, he put it out and then from that rib made the woman. Made the woman Eve. So, from dust, God made man. And from man, God made woman. And no wonder there are Christians or in wedding sermons I have often heard my previous pastors and many other pastors talking about women are twice refined. You know, men from mud. And then uh, when God made man a masterpiece, we are already a masterpiece. And then God took from the masterpiece to create an even better masterpiece. Theologically, is wrong. We are just the same, okay? A masterpiece. Don't believe me? When, when women die, they also go back to dust. <laughs> so anyway, what I'm saying is that uh, we are made of the same substance. We are made of the same material. Then God brought the woman to the man and presented her to the man. Uh, so I can hear God almost imagine God saying, hey, look, Adam, look, Adam. See the helper that I make for you. You know, guess what? God, God was very excited. God was very excited to see the excitement in, in, in Adam. And Adam was ecstatic. It was like, whoa. After all the animals and the birds, woman, you know. Do you know why woman is called woman? Do you know why? You don't know. Because when Adam saw the woman, he said, whoa, man. <laughs> That's why woman is called woman. If you believe me, you didn't read the Bible. The Bible was very clear, right? What did he say? Because woman was taken out from man. Because she was taken out from man. Therefore, it's woman. Uh, so you've got to go back to the original language, okay? That is the reason why. I was talking a little bit of nonsense just now. So please, huh? Do you say, you know, my pastor say, <laughs> oh, that would be disastrous. Man. Nobody will come to Rock of Ages Church. So we, you know, Adam rubbed his eyes and then shook off the, the effects of the anesthesia. Uh, he could see that the woman was not like the rest of the living creatures. She looked different. She looked like him, rather. She looked like him, yet different. In certain areas, significantly different. You know, I have a T-shirt that I brought during a mission trip in, 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 in Cambodia a couple of years ago. And you know, the front is the words and blaze on the word, same, same. And then when you turn behind, it's but different. Okay? Same, same, but different. So that's how, that's man and woman. Same, same, but different. We have many similarities. We are both thinking uh, beings, but we are differences in many different ways. Biologically, in certain strength, in certain weaknesses, we are the same, but we are also different. So far in Genesis, we have only God speaking, right? So far it's only God speaking. You reading and God speaking. Now, Adam spoke for the first time. And when he first speak, uh, he didn't just speak softly. He exclaimed very loudly. What did he say? Genesis 2.23 this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of pain. What does bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh means? What does it mean? You know, one Bible commentator, you, you, when you flip through many, many different commentators, uh, they, they say different things. Of course, certain common things they say. Uh, there are some commentators who, 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 who suggests that this phrase is probably a romantic expression during those ancient times. Okay? Uh, maybe it is, it is possible. Uh, it is possible. Uh, what was romantic then may not be romantic now, right? You read it, 
bone of my bone, talk about my bones, talk about my flesh, how to be romantic. It certainly cannot be romantic, uh, but maybe, maybe it's possible, okay? At that time, certain things sound romantic, okay, in their language, in the jargon, uh, but now it doesn't sound romantic. I'll give you one example, okay? Let's have some fun here. Give you some example. Songs of Solomon. You know it's a love song, okay? It's a love song. It's a super love song. And in, in chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, it says, uh, no, we are Song of Solomon, okay? He said, uh, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. That sounds okay. And then he says, Your eyes, you know, this is Solomon writing to, 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 the, to the beloved. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Doves, pigeons. You want to say my eyes is big? Say my eyes is big. You say my eyes is like pigeons. <laughs> I peck your eyes and you know. Your hair is like a flock of goats. <laughs> this gets even worse. And look at the description. Go, flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes. You know, the young of, uh, young of what? Sheeps, right? That have come up from washing. The more he say, the worse it becomes. All of which bear twins and not one of uh, among them has lost its young. Uh, I, I, I get lost here, okay? By then I say, Solomon, uh, people say that you're the most romantic fellow around in the Bible. I'm not. In the modern context, I'm not very sure. Your lips are like a scarlet thread. You see, in the past, small mouth, thin lips are considered, were considered beautiful. Today, thick lips, big mouth considered. <laughs> right? You look at all the models. Big mouth, thick lips. But in the past, like a scarlet thread, you know, you know what? You know what a scarlet thread? One thread, one red thread. So small. They say your mouth is lovely. Okay? Your cheeks are like, wow, this one more jalat, man. Halves of a pomegranate behind your face. <laughs> you know what's a pomegranate or not? You know the fruit you open up, there are a lot of red seeds inside there, very difficult to eat. So your cheeks are like <laughs> two halves of pomegranate. I look at it, I say like a lot of pimples like that. But it's a love song. It's in the Bible. And, and I mean, this is the height of aesthetic, romantic expressions. So, well, maybe bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh could also be a romantic expression during Moses' time. But I don't know. I really don't know. But I thought I'd tell you, I'd tell you this, all right? Uh, it, it's, anyway, it's fun fact. Fun fact in the Bible. But I'm sure of this one thing. Flesh of my flesh means a close relationship. Flesh of my flesh means a close relationship. I'm not reading into it. In another part of Genesis, when Joseph's brother refer to Joseph, you know, they want to sell him to slavery and one of them say that, hey, you know, his flesh, he's our own flesh. It refers to his one of us. That means we got a, we got a close relationship. We are related by blood. It means closeness. It means intimacy. We are brothers. We are together. We are partners, you know. Then citing some other references, some theologians argue that bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh carries a covenant significance in the ancient time or covenantal significance in the ancient time. Meaning to say that in those times, people used the phrase bone of my bones and flesh of my bone, uh, flesh of my flesh to to pledge allegiance to one another, to swear an oath to one another to say that we make a covenant here, okay? We are brothers. When we die, we die together. When we live, we live together. We, 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 we enjoy our glory together, okay? We suffer together, you know, making covenant. So that is one of the covenant formula, or covenant uh, phrases that they use. You know, we are, you know, you cut the thing, cut your, your hand, uh, your hand, uh, put inside the water and you drink, you know, we swear to be blood brothers, you know. In, I, I like Usia Xiao, so, so you have a lot of all these. Uh, 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 now we are bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So, theologians suggested that, and, and that is a common belief, okay? And, and, and that is something that I take it very seriously. It is a pledge of loyalty and commitment. 
to one another. So essentially, Adam, on looking at Eve, was pledging his loyalty, commitment, and love to the woman that God has created to be his suitable helper. Instinctively, men understand loyalty and love and commitment. And this is exactly what Adam was saying to Eve. I love you. I pledge to be committed to you. I pledge to be loyal to you for the rest of eternity. This is exactly what is happening. Okay, And for your information, the, the word woman in Hebrew is Isha. Uh, it can also mean wife. So woman, wife in this context is one and the same. So this is actually a marriage sin. This is actually a marriage sin where God presented the woman to Adam. It's like the father presenting the bride to the groom. God presenting the woman to Adam and Adam making a pledge, an oath of loyalty and commitment and love to his wife, Eve. First of all, God functioned as a matchmaker. And then after that, God functioned as a solemnizer of the wedding. How beautiful is that? Okay, it's not, it's not makeup. You go back to the original work, you go back to understanding what the phrases mean biblically, the text interpreting itself. This is exactly what the Word of God is conveying to us. The richness of the Word of God. If we care to dig deep into it or just sit there, reflect on it, Take hours reflecting on it. God will reveal to you wonderful, wonderful truths, wonderful, wonderful things. So here at the end of Genesis chapter 2, God instituted marriage. And I want us to know that the institution of marriage is created by God. You know, there are young people over the years, even before I was a pastor, people argue that, oh, we're going to get married soon. How come we can't have sex? We're going to get married soon. It's going to be one month away two weeks away, two days away, or one day away. But God instituted marriage. It's only within the bounds of marriage that intimacy, physical intimacy can take place. So God is not going to bother with one day, one hour before the marriage and all that. The institution of marriage is created by God. It is important. It must be respected. And traditionally, it has been respected by people of all different cultures through the centuries, not now, but for us Christians, let's respect the institution of marriage. It is very, very important, okay? So God created one man and then he created a woman and he put them together in marriage. After that, God declared these memorable words and this is really, really instructive. Genesis 2, 24 to 25. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. These instructions are given to married couples, also given to couples that, you know, you're courting now and you want to get married. And by the way, it is also given to parents. Okay, you'll know why as I move along. There are three things to take note here. I mean, I cannot go on a one sermon exposition here. So they are going to give you a couple of very important uh, understanding about what is said in this passage. Three things. And I frame it as leaving, cleaving, and weaving. Okay, I think I say something like that in one of your sermons, uh, one, of, uh, one of the weddings of the people here. Uh, but I'm going to say some different things. First, leaving. The man is to leave his father and mother. The man is to leave his father and mother. What does it mean? What does it mean to leave? Now, leaving means, leaving means that the young man, once married, does not come under the authority of his father and mother anymore. He comes out of their parental control and cover. That is what leaving means. Biblically, that's what leaving means. Coming out from under the authority of the parents, they are no longer, he's no longer under the control and the cover and the protective cover of his 
parents. And by the way, the instruction is given to men. The same thing applies to women. The man, together with his wife, now form a new family unit with the man being the new head of the marriage, the new head of the household, and the new head of the family unit. The priority of the relationship also changes. At one time, he was, his full loyalty is to his family. Full loyalty is to his parents. But now, the priority shifts from his parents to his wife, or his, to his wife, to his family. Okay? That will be his primary focus. And then some of us may wonder why the instruction about living is only given to men. I, 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 I think the answer is quite simple. Uh, you see, in ancient time, uh, it is it's mentioned this way, probably due to ancient time and traditional culture, where women marry outward. Women marry outward, and then in marriage, the man would take, would take the, the wife into the parents' family, right? That is the usual case. Uh, for the longest time in history. That is how it goes. And when that happens, when a newly married couple stays with the, uh, the man's parents, uh, out of habit, they will continue to come under the authority and control of the parents. Usually older people are a little bit more, you know, medicine, they think they know much, they give advice, they give, uh, you know, they say things, sometimes necessarily, sometimes unnecessarily. So, meaning to say that they will continue to exert their authority over the newly married couple. That's why the instruction in the context of Moses' time, in the context of ancient culture, this instruction is given to men rather than women. Because no problem. People don't get married and go to the, the wife's house to stay during those times, okay? During those times. Now, take note that a couple of things to take note about meaning that people, living that people get confused over. Living does not mean that married couples cut off their ties from their parents. It doesn't mean that way. They have to continue to honour their father and mother. Okay? Don't forget that honouring parents are enshrined in the 10th commandment. Anything inside the 10th commandment is woe. Serious stuff. You don't want to transgress that. Okay? And, and so living doesn't mean you sever the relationship. You don't honor your parents anymore. But on the flip side, it is good and necessary for parents to release their married children to run their own family autonomously. This is one of the biggest gifts that you can give to your children. Okay? Parents, you know, uh, don't put certa, you know, I mean, oh, cannot let go, cannot let go. Let them go. Release them. Release them. It is, it will be a tremendous gift for them. You may give your advice, you may continue to give your counsel, but do not interfere. Let them decide how they want to run their family. Let them decide how they want to run their children. I know after bringing them up from young to where they are, get married, you have a lot of experience. Okay, you are expert. And then expert always want to give their opinion. But sometimes you got to allow them to make mistakes. And then you come in. Don't say, there I told you. But put it nicely. Give advice, give counsel, but don't interfere unnecessarily. Your interference will only cause problems. So refrain. Okay, refrain. And these are the things. Okay, this is another important thing that I've seen. I've seen, okay, pastors and marriage counsellors, some of these people make this mistake and I want to make this clarification. Living does not necessarily mean physically leaving the parents' house. Although it is good, can afford it, it is good. But living doesn't mean physical living. Living doesn't mean physically leaving the parents' house. Some people mistakenly understand it to be the case. And it can cause a lot of confusion. It can cause a lot of trouble. Let me, let me explain to you why I say that. Okay? The context is always the Bible, right? 
Take for example the Jewish practice in ancient time. During Jesus' time, during Jesus' time, the people married young. Normally during their teens. You know, normally during their teens. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, probably about 14 years old, 14, 15 years old, already married, give birth to Jesus one year later. So they married young. In other words, they are still, they were still fully dependent upon their parents for their livelihood. Cannot even feed themselves how to feed their wife. So that is a context. Okay? If living means physically living, then you, you got to throw out the culture uh, during Jesus' time. And Jesus actually used this example of wedding to talk about him living. And then he will come back again. In my father's, I'm living right now, but in my father's house, there are many rooms and I'll come back to take you back. It's wedding language, okay? Uh, it's after the betrothal, this is wedding and so on, okay? Uh, let me not get uh, detour. So, during Jesus' time, when a young couple is betrothed to get married, the man's father will build an extension in his house. I mean, very small house, but they'll build an extension. Another one-room flat, carved out from beside the house. You know, land is free, big, carved out from there. And then, upon completion, the father will tell the son, you can go now and fetch your, your bride. Your house, your flat, your one-room flat is ready. You can go and fetch your bride. And again, wedding language. All right, Jesus has betrothed us. We are his, we are his fiancé, so to speak. We are his bride. He has returned, but he will come back to take us when all things are ready. So I'm saying all this to tell you that the context, even during Jesus' time, is valid. Although this is written by, 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 by Moses. So living cannot mean physically living. But there are benefits. If you can afford it, it's good. Okay? Work out. So these are personal arrangements and so on. So that is the Jewish context during Jesus' time. Uh, so... Essentially, living has to do with coming out of parental control rather than physically living. First, living. Next, cleaving. I better move fast. The man is to hold, to his, hold on fast, to hold fast to his wife. Cleave is an old English word, to cleave. To cleave to his wife, that means to hold tightly, to cleave on tightly. In marriage, the man and the woman are joined together in a permanent bondage. No, in a personal bond, not bondage. You know, marriage is not a bondage. They are joined together in a personal bond, okay, in a, per, in a, in a permanent bond. They are supposed to be super glued together, not to be broken apart. Marriage is a covenant. God's original intent as laid down in Genesis chapter 2, is for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Till death do us part. Many people go through the vow, never take this seriously. The moment you get married, you are not allowed to change. Cannot get, cannot regret. Okay? It's till death do us part, permanent. Per That's what cleaving means. That's what holding fast means. In his teaching on marriage in the Gospels, Jesus invariably quoted from Genesis chapter 2. Always go back to Genesis chapter 2. In the beginning, it was like this. In the beginning, it was not like this. In the beginning, it was like this. He always go back there to make his case that marriage must be permanent because that is God's will. And God does not like divorce. Biblically, but yet, divorce happened because mankind are corrupt and sinful. Biblically, divorce is permitted, strictly speaking, only in the case of adultery and sexual immor immorality. The word is not adultery, actually, in the original Greek. It's ponier. It's sexual immorality. Okay? From there, you get the word pornography as well. It's, it's sexual immorality. 
God, in that case, very straightforward, God permit divorce because of sexual immorality, because of adultery. That's explicitly stated. But implicitly, of course, there are other considerations. For example, physical abuse. Physical abuse, okay? So it's a complex topic. Uh, we'll talk about it another time, uh, not here. So let me go on to the third point. First leaving, second cleaving, third weaving. By weaving, I'm referring to a few things, which is associated with the idea of one flesh. Okay, we read just now one flesh, right? Genesis 2, 24, 25. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And a man and a woman were both naked, but they were not ashamed. Now, one flesh speaks of the uniting of the husband and the wife in the body. This clearly refers to the exclusive physical intimate relationship between the husband and, the, and, and his wife within the bound of marriage. Within the bound of marriage. Now, one flesh also speaks of the ongoing process of the husband and wife in weaving their lives together as a married couple. It is not restricted just to physical intimacy. It also means husband and wife weaving their life together, making effort, uh, uh, weaving their life together. You see, before that, they were individuals, living independent lives. But once married, they will have to learn to merge their lives together, develop shared dreams and purpose, agree on how they want their lives to be, make compromises to accommodate one another's habits, preferences, interests, likes and dislikes, even quirks and idiosyncrasies. And there are all these things, right? I mean, you get married after a while, you realise, oh, I didn't know my, my, my husband got this funny habit, you know, got this quirk here, really quirky here and there. Uh, but you've got to learn to adjust, learn to accommodate. Weaving your lives together does not come easy. It seems effortless. During the courtship time and the honeymoon period, after a few years, when familiarity sets in, children arrive, work and other pressure mounts. The couple will discover that they require hard work to keep their marriage happy and healthy. Marriage is hard work. I say that even during weddings. You want your marriage to be happy. You want your marriage to be healthy. It takes a lot of work. Two hands, both of you must clap. Okay? If one of you don't clap, tough. Okay? Okay, very quickly, we go to the last verse. Genesis 2.25 And a man and a wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now this verse captures the beauty of the close and intimate relationship enjoyed by the married couple. However, the reading, the, 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 the meaning, again, is not restricted to just uh, physical intimacy. It speaks of openness in a marriage relationship. Openness in a marriage relationship. The husband and the wife can be open and vulnerable to one another. You say whatever you want to say. Okay, you bear your soul. You talk about your deepest pain. You talk about your, your, your most cherished ambition, even if it's ridiculous. I want to be like Elon Musk, build a spaceship. To... Talk about that. Your wife is not going to criticize you. A, a lot of them do. <laughs> you, you say you want to build a spaceship. <laughs> Stupid. Talk like that. Please grow up. Uh, uh, but that's after the fall, okay? Before the fall, oh, spaceship can. I built together with you, darling. <laughs> so they can be open and vulnerable with each other without fear of reprisal, without fear of betrayal. You see, Adam and Eve enjoy such intimate and close relationship until sin steps in. And then there's blame. 
finger pointing and every other bad things that you and I understand is part of our human nature. In conclusion, let me quote from the beloved 17th century commentator, Matthew Henry. Okay, a lot of you know this guy, Matthew Henry. On his thoughts concerning God's creation of the woman, he said this, the woman was not made out of man's head to top him, not out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his, his sight to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Therefore, there is no room, ladies and gentlemen, there is no room for male chauvinism and there is no room for feminism. Men and women are created equal. Men and women are created equal. However, men and women are not created the same. They are not created the same. Equality doesn't mean that a man and a woman are the same. They are equal, but they are also different in many ways, in many significant ways. So, I think it's important, whether you're single or you're married, let us celebrate the similarities and let us also celebrate of, of humanity and let us also celebrate the differences between men and women. And men and women, whether in the workplace or whether in the marriage, we must learn to yield and surrender ourselves to one another in order to make our society work well, our workplace work well, our church flourish, and especially our marriage to prosper in many sense of the word. That is God's creation order. And I'll tell you something, okay? If you keep to God's creation order, if you keep to the law of nature that God has put in place, God will bless you. God will bless you husband, God will bless you wife, God will bless your family, God will bless your children, God will keep everything in order and the blessing will be transmitted into every area of your life. You know, we don't know how important it is to keep the creation order, to obey the creation order. Do it and you will be blessed. Man is a masterpiece of God's creation. And today we go through the portray, the, you know, uh, the beautiful portrayal of the creation of woman from the rib of a man. And by it, it shows that woman is also a masterpiece. Adam is a masterpiece. Eve is also a masterpiece. Man, you are a masterpiece of God. Woman, you are a masterpiece of God. Okay, boys and girls, you are also masterpieces of God. So in closing, can we bless one another? Can I have the man to turn to the woman and say, Whoa, you are a masterpiece. Hey, say la. Even you are not husband and wife, please say to one another, You are a masterpiece. Maybe you'll get free coffee. If she's happy, you'll get a free lunch. And then woman, girls, why don't you declare, right? Declare. Say, say to yourself, I am God's masterpiece. Okay, come on loudly. I am God's masterpiece. And can all the ladies say, Hallelujah, Amen.